Number two, Supergirl. The Maid of Might takes flight in her first ever TV series. The series starts with Kara's origin on Krypton. No mention is made of Argo City, which, in the original Silver Age telling of the story, survived Krypton's explosion. In this version, however, presumably her family perished with the rest of Krypton. Kara is a preteen and is sent to Earth to watch over her cousin Kal-El, who is only a baby at this point. It's kind of a tall order to send a 13-year-old alone on a strange new world to look after an infant. The series' carnal sin seems to be laying the girl power theme incredibly thick. It might have been most overpowering in the fact that Kara's dad, Zorel is barely seen or mentioned in favor of her mother, Allura. I don't mind Allura getting some more prestige than usual, but it doesn't really need to be at the expense of Zorel, does it? Kara's ship takes a detour into the Phantom Zone and pulls the prison Fort Raz to Earth. During her voyage to Earth, a time lapse in the Phantom Zone causes her to not age, while Superman has grown to adulthood by the time she lands. He takes her to live with the Danvers. I guess Ma and Pa Kent are dead at this point. They're played by the original Supergirl, Helen Slater, and former TV Superman, Dean Cain. They raise her along with their daughter, Alex. We really only get a crash course in Kara's history on Krypton. The pilot could have seriously benefited from a two-hour length. Kara works for Cat Grant, who routinely mispronounces her name. Her function seems to be to give Kara the right lesson she needs, albeit in an insulting and backhanded type of way. Kara makes her first public display of her powers when she saves Alex from a plane crash, just like Superman's first amazing feat, as we are told by Jimmy Olsen. She embarks on a career in crime fighting, taking, and more often rejecting, fashion advice by her pal Wynn. The costume they settle on is reasonably faithful to her Silver Age costume, yet, inexplicably, the yellow portion of the S-Shield is omitted. I also have to wince at the laughably bad idea of putting dark stockings on her. Are they durable Kryptonian nylons, resistant to runs? The real-life reason is because the SJWs running the show couldn't risk any of the icky men in the audience getting a thrill from seeing her bare legs. It makes even less sense when you consider Kara is working in the office wearing short dresses all the time. I guess a superhero costume is supposed to be inherently provocative or something? But that's a rant to be continued at a later time. It's revealed that her sister Alex works for some paranormal bureau called the DEO, which kind of reminded me of the latter seasons of Superboy. The DEO is led by Hank Henshaw, played by BBC America's Robin Hood's reimagined Friar Tuck actor, David Harewood. Melissa Benoist really hits a home run with Kara slash Supergirl. She's really the perfect embodiment of the character. She's adorable, virtuous, optimistic, and any other of the classic attributes one associates with the Maid of Might. I didn't really care for this new and improved Jimmy Olsen. Virtually nothing about him is in common with the classic comic book version of Jimmy, which Weird Al would aptly describe as white and nerdy. McCod Brooks does a fine job, but I prefer to think of him as a completely new character named James that just happens to be a photographer and has some vague history as Superman's friend. He does have Superman's signal watch, which is a nice touch. He and Kara eventually take a trip to the Fortress of Solitude, which I'd have preferred Superman be involved in. Ironically, or perhaps it was by design, much like the original Supergirl movie, Jimmy is dating Lucy Lane, Lois's little sis. She begins as a rival to Kara for Jimmy's affection before becoming a full-fledged ally by the end. The show's de facto Lex Luthor is one Max Lord who tries his hand at outwitting Supergirl for much of the early goings. Despite the trappings of a poor man's Luthor, he's actually quite compelling. He has a certain charm about him, and it's not unreasonable when Alex seems to take a shine to him. One of the more impressive villains is Superman baddie Livewire, where, much like her cartoon counterpart, she's a shock jock who is given the power to shock with electricity. I like the way she's realized visually, but whose bright idea was to give her black contact lenses? Remove them at once. As most people learned, the female empowerment was very heavy-handed in the early half of the season. The Supergirl naming scene is painfully longer than necessary. Rather than just have Supergirl own the name, they seem to fear rankling feminists and make a bigger deal apologizing for it than need be. The show's low point, in my opinion, is the Red Tornado episode, where essentially everyone treats everyone else like crap for the whole show. Supergirl learns from Kat that it's basically alright to take your frustrations out on someone of less significance than you, eventually leading her to unleash all her pent-up fury on Red Tornado, destroying him, despite his becoming a sentient being as we're told by that point. It's ultimately a sad misuse and waste of a great Justice League character. 
The season's big baddie is revealed to be Kara's aunt, who not only survived the destruction of Krypton in the Phantom Zone, but is apparently Alora's twin sister. She starts out the season being ruthless and willing to kill Kara without hesitation, yet after the first couple episodes, they soften her character considerably, making her objective not to kill Kara, but to sway her to her cause of conquering the Earth. A coup she apparently already tried without success on Krypton, leading Alora to sentence her to the Phantom Zone. Astra's lieutenant is her husband Non. Yes, like that Non from the Donner films. This version, however, has nothing in common with that version. Kara doesn't have a particularly close relationship with Non, hardly even identifying him as her uncle. Eventually, it's revealed that Hank has a secret of his own, though it's not what the sisters think. Jeremiah Danvers went missing while last in Hank's company, leading the two to suspect him of foul play. But in reality, he's actually Jean Jones, DC's Martian Manhunter. Several viewers suspected the character of being Cyborg Superman, as the character's name Hank Henshaw would suggest. But having another DC B-list hero on the show was a pretty bold move, and effective too. After Jean tells of his daughter's deaths on Mars, it's really nice to see how he views the sisters as his own adopted family. Jean's look is realized very well, yet you can tell budget prevents him from appearing in his true form for more than a few seconds at a time. His powers come in handy, not the least of which happens at the mid-season point where a cat suspects Kara of being Supergirl. The resolution of the dilemma is delightfully Silver Age, as Jean impersonates Supergirl in front of Kara and Cat. Can I also say just how great it is to have the secret identity thing taken on faith? It's very old school. Glasses are enough to protect her secret, while Flash and Arrow overkill on the concept with voice modulators and face blurring at super speed. Here they expect the audience to buy the concept as is, and as it has been for three quarters of a century at this point. The show really picks up after the mid-season break. Most shows tend to struggle to find their footing during the first half of their first season, so it's not so unusual here. The feminist platitudes get dialed back considerably, and the stories become more ambitious and comic book oriented. Supergirl tangles with a few of Superman's classic foes this season, most notably Toy Man. Frankly, I was a bit disappointed at this incarnation. I was hoping for a wacky, zany, trickster-style character, but he turns out to be Wynn's dad and sort of a run-of-the-mill crazy guy without any colorful trappings. The somber effect he has on Wynn isn't a barrel of laughs either. Now, I really like the dynamic between Kara, Jimmy, and Wynn. They both support her, both have feelings for her, and both pretty much suppress those feelings for her. Yet, despite Wynn and Jimmy having some moments of rivalry that mostly plays for laughs, they genuinely seem to get on as friends. No drama between the two. At this point, Wynn voices his love for Kara, and you really feel for the guy. He's risking it all for the chance with a goddess he'll probably never get. Kara doesn't respond quite in kind, but the problem with the relationship is one common to the CW shows where they insist on keeping their destined pair together. Felicity, Felicity, Felicity. Don't argue, Black Canary's dead, it's destiny. Iris, Iris, Iris. Forget how great Barry was with Patty, it's destiny. And now in this case, it's Jimmy, Jimmy, Jimmy. Forget he already has a hot girlfriend of his own, it's destiny. But I think why it's smart so much here, though, is that I'm guessing many of us identify with Wynn as the shy, nerdy guy. I'd really like to pull for him to get together with her, but the showrunners quickly get past Wynn's romantic overture and set him out with a future baddie. More on that later. And from the little revealed about next season, it doesn't sound as if they intend to go back to it. Why is it that the Olicity shippers have the pull to get Ollie set up with the nerdy girl, yet here, Kara needs to end up with the underwear model? I mean, fair's fair after all. Jean's backstory gets special attention in an episode where he faces a white Martian, his race's natural enemy. In the meantime, Kara reunites Kat with her estranged son, Adam, played coincidentally by Melissa's real-life husband, Blake Jenner. Little nepotiz. This gives Callista Flockhart a good opportunity to show a little more depth with Kat. The season really kicks into gear at this point, with Max Lord creating a Supergirl Bizarro. A clone of sorts that has all the powers of Supergirl, but in reverse. Kara manages to defeat her both with strength as well as compassion. Next up, another strong outing with For the Girl Who Has Everything, a version based on the popular Alan Moore Superman story, For the Man Who Has Everything. In this version, Non sends a black mercy which attaches itself to Kara, projecting her into her perfect fantasy. She returns to her life on Krypton as if she never left. Her parents are still alive, Astra is an evil, and a young kid by the name of Kal-El comes over to play. 
This story actually works better for Supergirl than it does for Superman, as the show plays up the fact that Kara actually has memories of Krypton, having lived there for 13 years, where Clark really has no memory of the place and might just as well have been born on Earth. Kara actually knows what she lost when Krypton blew up. I only wish the episode was a two-parter. It would have been nice to spend more time on Krypton and perhaps meet Jor-El and Lara. I doubt many more such opportunities to visit the place will afford themselves in the future. In a humorous subplot, Hank attempts to cover for Kara at Catco by imitating her. Eventually, Supergirl goes off to face Non, while Alex and Jean face Astra. In a pretty cool battle between Astra and the Manhunter, Alex kills her. Hank, however, takes the fall with Kara, claiming the kill as his own for a time, which drives a wedge between the two until Alex comes clean. It's great just how they take pains to show Kara's belief that killing is never an option. This is classic Superman theology at work. Would that our big screen version of DC's Big Three have the same convictions. Another of Superman's classic foes, the Master Jailer, makes an appearance. In this case, though, he's realized as an alien with advanced tech that used to be a jailer on Fort Roz. Despite these alterations, I enjoyed the actor and costume design. Master Jailer has ever been one of Soup's unsung villains. But I've always liked him, and hopefully they'll endeavor to use him again in the future. Probably the single best episode in the season is the Red Kryptonite episode, where Max Lord's supposed noble attempt at making synthetic kryptonite to use against Non goes horribly wrong, affecting Supergirl by turning her evil. He must have used Tar. The Superman 3 comparisons don't end there, however. There's a hilarious scene of Supergirl flicking peanuts at bottles in a bar, shattering them. It's a great recreation of the scene in Superman 3. The episode also has much to thank Spider-Man 3 for as well, as Kara rats out her unscrupulous rival, as well as Wynn's new girlfriend, Siobhan, causing her to be fired, and having a devastating conversation with Alex. In the end, Hank reveals himself as the Martian Manhunter to subdue Kara long enough for Alex to blast her with Max's cannon cure-all, and gives himself up to the D.E.O. Melissa Benoist just kills it in this episode, not only as the evil Supergirl, but once the veil of evil is lifted and she returns to normal, she gives just a heartbreaking performance. The only thing that could have made the episode better was, again, if they would have made it a two-parter. Here, Supergirl throws Cat off a roof, and naturally catches her to prove a point, and suddenly the whole town doesn't trust her, and the SWAT teams are out using live ammo to get her. They could have built it up a bit more, but the show being on CBS felt like it was existing on borrowed time already. They couldn't spare the great episodes in the limited time they had, so one gets the sense they're throwing all their good ideas into this season, just hoping it gets popular enough to get a second season at all. Hank and Alex are arrested and are to be taken to Cadmus. Kara trusts her secret to Lucy, who ends up becoming the new head of the D.E.O. The two break Hank and Alex free. During a mind meld, Jean learns Jeremiah Danvers is still alive, leading to the season's main cliffhanger. Fans' hopes were realized when The Flash made a jaunt from CW over to CBS to join Supergirl for an episode. It was really fun to see the two together, and Grant Gustin and Melissa Benoist have a spectacular rapport. The episode does have the same problems as the Arrow-Flash crossover, where they choose now, of all times, to focus on the hero's love life. I question Barry's rather careless nature with his secret identity, despite being on a parallel world. And of course, they do the cutesy cliché that Cat can figure out Barry's the Flash, despite being oblivious to Kara. We're also treated to a villain team-up, the villains in this case being Siobhan, Kara's Cat co-rival turned Silver Banshee, and the returning Livewire. At this point, National City still doesn't trust Kara, so the resolution of the story has the citizens aided by some firemen actually defeating the villains to protect Supergirl. It's a nice gesture and all, but it's kind of weak sauce as a resolution for what was at least then touted as a -a once-in-a-lifetime superhero team-up. In the end, the two race to break Flash back through the barrier, sending him back home. Though, awkwardly, Supergirl can never know if he was successful. And over on the Flash... Barry inexplicably says nothing about this little excursion. Smallville's Supergirl actress Laura Vandervoot joins the cast as Brainiac 8, a.k.a. Indigo. She allies herself with Non. Non seeks to fulfill Astra's grand plan called Myriad. He succeeds in getting all of National City under his sway, by making all humans connected in some kind of hive mentality. To serve his will, all for the sake of the greater good. Kara goes to the Fortress of Solitude to seek out Superman, but he's not at home, attending to some business off-world. When he returns, he's also quickly swayed and put out of action. Cat and Max are the only ones beside Kara to retain their free will. 
due to an invention of Max's. Alex and Jean abandon their Cadmus side mission and return to help Supergirl, but Alex is soon used as a pawn of Non to battle Supergirl in a kryptonite-powered suit. Eventually, in a nice bit of symbolism, Alex's mom, played by Helen Slater, the original Supergirl, comes to the rescue and saves our current Supergirl. Long story short, Supergirl broadcasts a message of hope that wakes everyone from their hive mind. It's great that the showrunners seem to have gone out of their way to emphasize the fact that Superman and, by extension, Supergirl are supposed to be seen as symbols of hope and optimism. Something that's been sadly lacking in our current big screen adaptation of Superman. Much has been made of the fact Superman isn't seen in the season, something they apparently intend to rectify next season. But I think it was handled pretty well. This is supposed to be Kara's story. At the end of the day, it's her show. And having Superman front and center every time a crisis occurs is a disservice to her. To their credit, they also get the voice of Superman right, so to speak. Whenever he's texting Kara, it does actually feel like you're reading what the honest-to-goodness Superman would be saying. It's nice to know the Man of Steel will be actually appearing next season, and that he's in competent hands. At Indigo's behest, Non then turns his plans towards killing all the humans in Shades of X-Men 2. Supergirl and Martian Manhunter take off to face them in what is thought to be a suicide mission. In another amusing tribute to the original film, Non's MacGuffin is the Omega Hedron. Supergirl is rescued from drifting off in space by Alex, who flies Kara's original pod. Frankly, I never liked the real-life connotations of Soup not being able to breathe in space, so I'd have preferred they not done so here. Hank is reinstated as head of the DEO, and Kara is given a promotion by Cat and a new office. It comes at the right time, as Callista Flockhart will be having a reduced role next season. So in the final analysis, it was a very strong season that took a while to find its footing, but Melissa Benoist is amazing as Supergirl. The rest of the cast is very strong, and after about the mid-season point, they minimalized the feminist trapping significantly, focusing on a very Silver Age-feeling theme for the show. If they can keep that flavor going now that they're taking the show to the CW, the Maid of Might should be soaring high for a long time to come. I'm giving Supergirl Season 1 four and a half stars out of five. This is Johnny Torch reminding you, keep the flame burning brightly, and I'll be with you again real soon.